Welcome back to the Nikki Clark Show. The show is about transforming lives one story at a time. And I'm always excited to invite people from all walks of life to come and share their heart stories, stories of transformation and upliftment. And I'm super excited and honored to have uh, a wonderful individual uh, with us today. She is the former Deputy Chief of Police of Peel Regional Police uh, in uh, uh, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and uh, she's uh, done wonderful things in the community. And we're going to hear um, the story behind the story of uh, her 34 uh, years of service in the community. So please welcome Ingrid Berkeley Brown to the show. How are you doing today, Miss Ingrid? I'm doing good, Nikki. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I, I really appreciate it. It's, it's sunny outside. It's warm. So I'm doing very well. <laughs> Awesome. Yes, thank you so much uh, for your time. And, and as I glance out the window, I do see the sun, and uh, I'm hoping it is as warm as the sun is shining down. So uh, tempting to go later on for a little walk, uh, minding, of course, social distancing, but uh, going to get some sunshine for sure. So I, I really appreciate your time, and uh, I want to say congratulations again uh, for um, your retirement years. Uh, 34 years, uh, you know, in in the community is uh, not uh, anything to um, shy away from. It's it's a, it's a big achievement, and I wanted to talk about your journey leading up to that. So, can you tell us a little bit about your background leading up to uh, becoming um, such uh, an incredible force in the community? So, um, it, it can be a long journey. So, it will take a bit of. <laughs> But, That's okay, we have know, time. Uh, okay. Uh, so I, I'll start by just saying that um, I immigrated from Guyana in 1974. Um, mm-hmm. I was the youngest of 11 children. My dad was a police officer um, in Guyana. He passed, and my mom was a housewife. Uh, my dad passed away when I was six. So kind of my knowledge of my dad as, uh, as a police officer was more so the days I would see him at home and seeing him polish the buttons on his uniform and, mm-hmm. you know, remember, you know, remembering him there as the very tall gentleman. Um, so immigrated to Canada at 14. Um, with, as a, my mom, of course, was a widow at this time. We, when we first moved to Canada, predominantly lived in the um, area of Wilson and Bathurst, predominantly mm-hmm. Jewish community. When I... Um, my last year of high school, so I probably was around maybe 17, we moved to the Jane Finch community, um, which was quite an experience. I, I have great opportunities in Jane Finch. I know we hear things about Jane Finch, but for me, it was a positive experience. Um, mm-hmm. While I, I got married at a pretty early age, I was 21, um, mm. so my mom financially could not afford to send us to um, post-secondary education. So for me, I always continued my studies, finished high school, graduated with a grade 13, but I always continued my post-secondary um, through the continuing education program. One of my field of studies at the time was in the social sciences. Um, mm-hmm. While I was there, a significant part of that is doing community work. I right. chose to do my community placement with um, probation and parole. And while working there, I had opportunity to meet um, a young black officer from Toronto, a male officer, and he kind of threw the idea to me, you know what, um, you'd be pretty good as a police officer. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it was, but he said that, and I jumped at that opportunity. So this would have been in 1981. I, um, I went to Toronto, back then it was called Metropolitan Toronto Police. I went down to their headquarters to start the application process, very different times back then. Once I entered that um, employment office, the first thing I had to do was stand on a scale, like a weight scale. Really? I was, um, <laughs> uh, this, this would probably have been, today I would know it as um, a systemic barrier. Um, mm-hmm. My weight at the time was 105 pounds, right? I was immediately told I was underweight and I was disqualified from the process. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, I continued working um, uh, in the area of social sciences. I was working at one of, um, I guess, what we would call back then a, a group home. So it was mm-hmm. a home for um, people with um, uh, certain um, mental challenges. 
So mm-hmm. I continued. I worked. After five years, I, got, I had my son. I decided to start the process again. So this would have been mm-hmm. in 1986, early 1986. Right. The first time I only applied to Toronto, but this time my plan was to apply to as many police agencies as I could. And okay. um, I decided to apply to Toronto. Uh, someone mentioned Peel. I had no idea what Peel was or where it was. <laughs> I applied to Peel. I applied to the OPP and I applied to the RCMP. Um, okay. Did all of my testing. I was successful with all of my testing. Um, and that testing is an academic and a physical. So mm-hmm. I, I finished those. I went for a second interview. I got an interview this time with Toronto. I, I, it's funny because I don't remember standing on the scale the second time. I probably did. <laughs> I can't <recall. laughs> um, it's, it's just one of those things perhaps I just wanted to get out of my memory. Um, right. So I, I, I went for an interview in Toronto. I was told again in Toronto that um, I got that note saying that I was unsuccessful. Meanwhile, I also heard from Peel Police. Um, right. And I went to Peel, you know, did my interview, um, everything else. You did the test, uh-huh. you did everything. And yes. I, Peel is the first one that gave me the call and said, you know, that they're interested in hiring me. I had to go for an interview in front of senior officers. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, I started. A little intimidating, Peel. huh? <laughs> it was very intimidating. I was always <laughs> very small stature. And mm. it, it's interesting because even the panel they actually sat ab- above the, you know, above you, like they were sitting on an elevated platform. I, I just couldn't oh. remember one of these three large, you know, I, at the time I, I wasn't even focusing on color, but they were all three white gentlemen, and, mm-hmm. uh, and, and I was pretty naive. I, I really didn't know very much about policing itself, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they, they offered me the... I, I, was offered the job and um, started with Peel. And, uh-huh. you know, this was in 1986. Um, very few females were even in the organization at the time, even the class I was in. We were, the class I was in was a class of 32. And at that time, there were four females in the class. And this was the largest number of females that was, were high, was hired at one time. So, it, mm-hmm. you know, remember, it made the Brampton Guardian back then. But we weren't just the largest with the females, but we were also the most diverse. Mm-hmm. So there were four um, other, three males, one, one male um, black gentleman. He was from Jamaica, um, a South Asian male. He was from Trinidad, um, another South Asian male, actually, from India. And then we mm-hmm. had um, one... Um, Chinese, uh, one officer that was Chinese. So we were kind of the, the I don't know, what would you call it? Um, we were, it was a showcase because it was, <laughs> female, it, was, it was very diverse. So we got lots of, um, you know. So you were the diversity. That, <laughs> the, that, the, the handful. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, yeah. I, when I was in my class, and this is in the Peel class, which was 32 of us, I would have been one of the um, oldest. I was the only mm-hmm. female, sorry, the only black female, um, and I was also the only one that um, was a mother. My son was three years old at the time wow. when, I, when I started with PL. Um, you know, it was, it was um, again, a, a little bit of an intimidating experience because it, it's something that I was also out of my own comfort zone. I, right. I grew up in, like I said, in Jane Finch, and I was mostly a predominantly black community. Most of my mm-hmm. social circles were from the black community, and this was a very, you know, a mainly um, a male Caucasian environment. So it was a little bit different for me. Um, what, as a police officer, one thing that um, I think the community does not realize is every member that's a police officer in Ontario has to go to um, into Almer, Almer, Ontario, which is just east of London, and that's mm-hmm. where the Ontario Police College is. So we all have to okay. go there, and back then you spent uh, approximately two months, and mm-hmm. that's where you got your ac- another uh, portion of your academic experience, so academic right. and physical experience. So, again, being up there, this was a group now of 300, so it would be almost like a regular college, 
right? And I know mm-hmm. you'd be familiar with this, Nikki, as a past professor. So it was like a college. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, again, because I had never um, attended uh, a full-time course of po- post-secondary studies, the environment of there was also very new to myself. I, at that point, there was 300 of us. There was, um, I would say, for myself, and there was one other black female, I, I call her my soulmate, Sonia mm. Thomas. We were the only two black females in this group of over 300 officers. Um, mm. it, was, it was an enjoyable time. I, I tell people that. I, again, I, I just had that opportunity to get to learn more about um, different cultures, different communities. But I also took that opportunity to ensure that I educated my colleagues on um, my community and, you know, who I was, right? Because I Mm -hmm. think for some of them, uh, they had limited exposure to individuals Mm -hmm. from the black community. So for Mm -hmm. me, it was was an opportunity to kind of share experiences. Um, It was a great time great group of people that um that i was with uh at that at that college so i uh finished that returned to my um to peel and Mm -hmm. uh started my true policing career right Mm. my my first uh three years as a police officer was as a patrol officer and Mm -hmm. i was um worked in brampton 22 division so that would be the one right opposite the courthouse so mm-hmm. that's where I started my career. My first, my first, um, what we would call a lateral transfer, and you have to apply for these transfers in policing. You're not just kind of selected and said and would be told, Ingrid, you're going here or you're going there. You have to apply. Right. Okay. I, I felt I made a conscious effort to um, apply towards the, for, so my first posting into community services. Mm-hmm. I spent two years um, there. And then my next three years I spent in the Race Relations Bureau. I chose those areas to apply to because um, for me as an individual, and perhaps it was my social sciences background, I Mm -hmm. really wanted to work in the community. My goal and what I wanted to do, I wanted to look at how we can build, how myself and PO Police can build bridges with Mm -hmm. the community. Right, so for me, mm-hmm. that was my focal point. It, it's and I, and I can say, in um, we're speaking frankly, it was they, mm-hmm. these positions were never considered. Um, I like to use the word coveted, like you know the the high positions. Everyone wanted to maybe work in homicide or or drugs or, but I I just kind of wanted to do that. I I've always had that um, knack for working in the community. Mm-hmm. So I so those were my first two postings. And I can tell you, through those two postings, I really was able to build relationships and get to meet key people in the region of Peel and community leaders, community members. So for me, that's kind of, I I like to call that my foundation Mm -hmm. in policing. Um, So I I did my time there, 1996, because then we were on that, social contract, right? We called it the Bobbery mm-hmm. Days, so no mm-hmm, movement, mm-hmm. 1996. I, um, I went back to uniform. I went back to uniform patrol. From that time um, in 2000, I went into the investigative bureau. There was a statute of limitations came into place um, on sexual assault because back prior to 1990, 1996, maybe, maybe it was later than that, but you had a certain um, number of years before sex assaults could be investigated because there was a statute of limitations, but that was removed in around 99, 2000, and Peel Regional Police opened a centralized um, child abuse sex assault unit. So Mm -hmm. I applied to that, and that was my first kind of investigative posting. While working in that unit in 2002, I got promoted to um, sergeant, um, and... You know, for my promotion, it wasn't, um, it wasn't easy. I, I, I had to apply at least three times before I actually was successful. And when I say that, that, that isn't something unique just to me. But one thing mm-hmm. I can clearly say is I really did not have any mentors within the organization. So right. 
I felt that maybe I was going into these things kind of blind. Um, a lot of my mentors were from community, people in the community who I had the opportunity to get to know. Um, so my first posting once I got promoted to, in 2002 was to, um, we call it, now it's, now it's known as um, corporate communications, but back then it was public affairs. So I was the sergeant in charge of our media relations. Mm-hmm. Uh, I worked kind of directly for the chief. I spent two years there. Then I went um, back to the road as a patrol sergeant. I spent um, about a year and a half as a patrol sergeant. And then uh, in 2006, I, I was made up. I wasn't given a rank of staff sergeant. It was what we would call an acting staff sergeant. A vacancy existed. I was put in our um, neighborhood policing unit. And I have to say the neighborhood policing unit, it is the one where we have the school resource officers, the bike officers. So that was, again, a position that brought me back again into that direct contact with the community. Certainly, as a patrol officer, you always have contact with the community. But when you're mm-hmm. in the specialized unit, it's a bit of a different kind of um, interaction. So these were about, again, forging those relationships with the community. Right. Uh, right? So those were key. And, and I'll say it was while I was in the neighborhood policing unit, I had occasion to meet Tom um, Garnet Manning. I'm sure you probably mm-hmm. know Garnet. <laughs> yes. So I, I had occasion to meet him. He worked with one of the local um, agencies in Peel. So I spent, um, uh, I think, maybe two or three years in that unit. I actually got promoted to staff sergeant. Then I went to the recruiting bureau, right? The recruiting mm-hmm. bureau for me was, um, was an opportunity to really, because it was about um, hiring, working hard to hire diverse candidates to reflect the community. So that was one of the key things that, um, and mantra that I had when I went there. But it was also an organizational goal. As an organization, mm-hmm. that's what we wanted, right, to make sure that we had that representation of our community. So I spent, um, I think, about three years in the race relations unit, sorry, in recruiting unit. Then I returned to um, frontline, so frontline being the officers on patrol as a staff sergeant. When I, and as a staff sergeant, you are the ones managing the prisoners, working with, um, uh, with, with the officers that are going out on patrol. Uh, following that, I was promoted to inspector. Mm-hmm. I worked in the duty inspector's office. And uh, as a duty inspector, my role is to, um, it's not so much overseeing, but I would be the representative of the chief during off hours, because the duty inspector works 24 hours a day, like he or she works the same as the frontline officers. So when there's a major incident, it is the duty inspector's responsibility to ensure it's being managed appropriately. So I spent a year and a half in that area. Then I worked in a records bureau. Mm -hmm. Um, And the records bureau, of course, is where we manage all of the records, whether it's criminal records, um, probation and parole records, all records that are pertinent to Peel Regional Police, but also to people in the community, because that's where all of the people, right? Um, Mm -hmm. So I spent a year there. Then I was promoted to superintendent. I was Mm -hmm. a superintendent in charge of 21 division, and that is the division in Brampton, right at um, Central Park and Queen Street, so right opposite uh, Bramley City Center by by the region of Peel Building. Mm -hmm. I spent two years in that area, and then um, I got promoted to deputy chief. And, and the deputy chief's position with the posting, a key component of that position was community, working in right. the community. So, you know, I, um, it, it, it was a position where it is something you cannot enter into lightly, and I did not. Um, mm-hmm. Certainly, I, I, I always say I never made that um, I had decision in isolation. I spoke to my my uh, my husband, my family, and at this time I had a number of mentors within the organization to them to see, you know, what, what get their opinion, their feedback, what their thoughts were. Um, mm-hmm. I was successful. Uh, I spent so it's been two years as the deputy chief, and my position as a deputy chief was in charge of all of the operational divisions, which is four. Plus, we have an, a division that runs out of the airport. That right. division and 
Communications Bureau. So it mm-hmm. was, it was, um, it it's been challenging. Uh, there was a lot of um, of there was a lot of work involved. I mean, it goes goes without saying, right? That um, there was a lot of challenges um, along the way, whether it was um, even getting to become a police officer or mm-hmm. applying for the promotions, right? Or you know, just just some of the in incidents that you might have encountered along the way, whether it was within the organization or externally. But mm-hmm. I mean, I I like to think that um, I I use those challenges uh, and, as opportunities, right? Because they're they're things that you learn from, and and mm-hmm. you know, either this is a this is a good because challenges could be good or bad, right? This is good. This is not so great. I do not would not do this to someone else, and you know I didn't think this was the appropriate thing. But you, um, it's about being resilient. Um, mm-hmm. I, I have to say that um, as I moved up the ranks, I've for the most part things I've attended, events I've participated in, I've sat on a significant number of panels, been up uh, discussing things. I've always been. I, I hate when I say the word always, but for the most time, <laughs> I would be the yeah, the only black female in that room, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So um, you know, you you certainly had that um, extra pressure I felt mm-hmm. right along mm-hmm. the way um, to perform and to work harder, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but you did have that because you know I'm representing Peel Police, but I'm also um, representing my community. And for me, yes. kind of how I've always kind of managed my my way a lot along the way within the organize within throughout my career, I would say, thirty three years. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Uh, incredible. Really incredible. Um, a testament to your your uh, determination and uh, I guess fortitude of will. You know, uh, I'm listening to uh, you, and I and I hear the passion, and I hear um, how, uh, no matter what, I, I guess it's just your personality, your attitude, your values. Uh, you you look at, you know, obstacles as just okay, a, a learning opportunity, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 how to uh, use what you've learned, your values to. Uh, make changes for the future and, and how to overcome. So these, these are valuable, really valuable uh, lessons, I think, that uh, uh, you're sharing right now with us, and, and I really appreciate it. Uh, but I, I did have some questions um, as, as you were sharing uh, that kind of came to mind that I'd like to ask you. Um, now, I, I, I've spoken to a number of officers and I, I, not exactly a daughter of an officer uh, on the police force, but uh, a daughter of a, an army <laughs> sergeant. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if there's similarity, but I, I did hear that you can, there's a certain, um, I guess, uh, predisposition you have uh, when you have these kind of early experiences with someone who's already in the force. And, and, uh, and what I was told is like, oh, you can tell. And then I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, really? And yeah, they just just the way you talk, you know, just your mannerisms, you can tell that you've had it an, uh, like an interaction early, uh, whether it be you know uh, a family member in, in you know growing up. So I'm like, okay, so that would I guess my connection would be my father, and and then I'm hearing that your father was a police officer, and okay, so that kind of makes sense. So that that is it's, it's an, an incredible um, kind of. Um, kind of training ground very early uh, through these kind of indirect trainings uh, with people in your family. So now um, you, you decide to go into the force, which is fantastic. Uh, you are accepted at Peel. But I'd like to ask, um, what do you think are some of the qualities that police officers should have when they contemplate um, going into that career? And, and when, when, when you speak generally, also talk about some of the values that you brought to the force. I, you know, we can always go in or I can always say an officer has to be um, integrity's key part because those are some of the, um, the, the foundations of, of, uh, of a police policing. It should be ethical, should be integri- mm-hmm. integrity. But what I think is 
really key. It's about empathy. Mm -hmm. If you do not have that, it is very difficult to be a good police officer. You cannot become a police officer simply thinking that it's about arresting bad guys. That's Mm going to happen. You have to. It happens, right? But it's much more than that. It's about the ability to empathize with individuals. And we don't need to sit down, and it's not about coddling, but try to understand their situations. People do bad things, and and Mm -hmm. the, the consequences are there. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's, you, sometimes it's about really sitting back. They, they are going to be arrested. They are probably going to be going to jail. But sometimes you have to take that time and take a, little, a step back and just understand, right, so that this person's situation may have been what's created that person, you know, to be where they are. Uh, and so to me, a key thing is empathy. A significant one is, and these go kind of hand in hand, interpersonal skills because it's how you speak to people. Like I said, I'm I'm pretty small as a police officer, right? And I think people will say, you know, people in the general public will say, well, were you ever assaulted? Did people have, you know, I might have had one incident of where someone, when I tried to arrest them, they tried to resist arrest, right? Mm -hmm. But I think it's because I had that ability to communicate with them and I spoke with them in a manner that it wasn't about, you know, the big bad cop, right? Mm -hmm. It was about talking to them, you know. You were able to diffuse the situation, right? Correct, correct. Mm -hmm. So we learn a lot about um, a use of force model and, you know, the, the, what is it called, the communication skills and, you know, you have Mm -hmm. to be able to. But that is something that you need to be able to do when you come in. Right. Okay. Everyone coming in have to recognize it's not about just arresting bad guys. Bad guys are always going to be there. We are going to arrest them, right? But it's the way you go about it because a significant number, and I'm not going to give a percentage, of people in our community are really good people. When we go to someone's home, they are calling us because they're in need of something, right? They're mm-hmm. in need. And we have to be that empathetic and, and listen and hear. It, it may be a domestic, mm-hmm. but you know that there's always one person that domestic that is the mm-hmm. victim, right? So you have to be able to um, speak with him or her that's the victim. And also, mm-hmm. you know, with the, the, the accused, the person you're going to arrest, right? But mm-hmm. you just can't just jump in and grab and, and then deal, ask questions later. We need to just take that time, slow down. Use mm-hmm. effective communication skills. Like you said, diffuse a situation, right? Mm-hmm. We deal a lot with people in, in a crisis. Uh, mm-hmm. So that is, that is one of the things that's being taught on a regular basis now. It is about okay. taking the time, slowing it down, communicating. Okay. There, there are situations okay. you have to run in, you have to, but those are few and far between. The majority. Right. So, so for me, empathy, interpersonal skills. Just they uh, go hand in hand. Yeah. 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 Yep. Uh, it, it, it's it's so true, uh, and and I I've, I've seen it uh, in in certain um, situations where a police officer was called in, and um, just to use them in a, as an example in this in this situation, they're very calm. And uh, they're almost, uh, I kind of recognized kind of a counseling quality they had. And they they, they were very uh, objective. So they didn't take sides. They just took, you know, separated what was happening uh, from the two sides. Uh, One, they both felt like victims, (laughs) the people in the scenario. Um, But he had to hear the story separately and and to kind of, um, uh, you know, use, words to diffuse and, and to bring down the tones of uh, the, the emotional reaction. So it was on an even plane uh, to get the facts, right? So it, it, right. It, 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 there's a bit of counseling too. And, and uh, also you have to be, I guess, very self-aware too, uh, because uh, we, we, are, we are human uh, when we enter into interactions with people. And sometimes we show up uh, ready to go and and empathetic and have everything, but some things could set us off. Uh, we can be tired. Uh, we can have our own personal baggage that's coming into play, and and it's not 
uh, allowing us to perform the way that we should. So we have to, I think, be very self-aware. Is, is that correct in policing? I, and when you're having that, those that moments? Is yeah. uh, absolutely, yeah. that is correct. And, I, and I'll tell you, the one thing that we do now in policing, and, and this is so unheard of, uh, sorry, it was unheard of years ago, but today it's so important, is about, um, like you said, self-awareness, but every police agency, I would say, within Ontario now have what we call a wellness unit, right? Mm. It's that opportunity for you. If you know you're having a bad day or, yes. you know, we don't want that officer to become uh, addicted to whatever that may be. So we mm-hmm. have that, those units there. We have wellness um, within our organization, peer support, mm-hmm. the wellness unit. If you are feeling those stressors or those pressures, you can mm-hmm. reach out to them and they will provide that. This is, you know, I, I think of um, as a deputy, we had a, a pretty gruesome homicide. This is, you know, mm. we had a very gruesome homicide. And um, I wanted to reach out to the young officers that attended the scene because they were very junior. And, I mean, I can honestly say in my 34 years, I have not, my, I, I've gone to homicide scenes. I have not had the opportunity to be the first one on the scene to get in there. So Mm -hmm. I I can't speak to what they, you know, what the impact was. But I wanted to reach out to those officers. But their Mm -hmm. superintendents indicated to me that um, having seen what they saw, they realized that they needed to take time off from work. Yes. And spend, I think they were home for maybe two weeks. But I'll Mm -hmm. tell you, when I would have started in 86, even in 90, they they wouldn't have done that because Mm -hmm. they would have felt this pressure to be that, machismo thing and show it back up to work right Mm -hmm. because of course Mm -hmm. if you were to say no i need some time for me because of what i saw it would be Mm -hmm. looked on as being kind of wimpy whatever but today it is such an important thing to do and and i know that we were peel police was one of the first to have a wellness unit and wonderful really does make a difference so it's working you know it's working with the members so that Mm -hmm. they don't get to that but, but you're right, people do come in, maybe they just had an argument with their own spouse, right, mm-hmm. before they showed up to work, and then they're going to a domestic. So it's mm-hmm. understanding, you know what, I need to be aware of this is not my personal situation, yes. I'm here as a police officer. So yeah, that self-awareness yes. is important. Yeah. Very important. Um, thank you for answering that, Anne. And I wanted to ask, um, you alluded to a situation where uh, some police officers, because of the trauma um, they experienced of a, you know, a homicide situation. Um, when I was uh, campaigning uh, for um, a, a federal election uh, last year, around September, I was in the neighborhood when uh, the eruption of violence happened in Malton. And uh, uh, although I was two streets away, um, the trauma was still felt. I, I still had, I had to take my own time <laughs> uh, to deal with it. So I cannot imagine those who witnessed and, uh, you know, had to, had to do kind of the, the investigation and that. So um, can, you, can you, you know, comment on uh, the process for those who were involved in, in that um, particular situation. I think it was September 13th last year in Malton. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I was, um, because I, as the deputy chief in charge of field operations, it would have been officers under my command that would be responding. So, mm-hmm. w- as I mentioned, we have the, the wellness uh, program. So, mm-hmm. generally, after a traumatic inc- um, incident, mm-hmm. the members, the officers who have attended, would have to go for what we would call a, a debriefing session, right? And is that so mandatory or, or voluntary? Sorry to interrupt you. It's voluntary. Okay. It's voluntary. Okay. Um, and it's our, our um, organizational wellness that would host that session. At times they may bring someone from outside in mm-hmm. to, to, you know, manage the discussion. It's voluntary, but, I, again, I can, I can tell you that I would say it's very rare that someone um, does, who was part of the incident do not attend. For okay. the, they all generally do. For the most part, every member who responded would attend. So one of the things that we're very also cognizant of is that our, off, 
or they're not officers, but they're civilians. We also have officers that work in our communications bureau. They are also mm-hmm. included in that because they are the ones that are speaking with, whether it's the victims or the witnesses. So even though they're not attending the scene, they're impacted by just the nature of the call because you can appreciate the caller would be, um, you know, very hysterical or obviously because of what's happening. So mm-hmm. we would also include them. What happens at Peel Police? And I would like to think this is in most agencies in Ontario. Certain bureaus have mandatory, um, have to see a psychologist um, every six months, and and in Peel it's called the Safeguarding Program. So Mm -hmm. the officers who are part of the um, Internet Child Exploitation Unit, the ones that are in our major collision bureau, I am, I, I'm not quite sure about homicide because the investigators in homicide, for the most part, they don't actually go into the scene, mm-hmm. right? So the officers from our Forensics Identification Bureau, which you probably would know as CSI, they all have to attend this mandatory safeguarding program every six months. Okay. So that's something, maybe it's been around maybe 10 years, or maybe a little bit less, but again, mm-hmm. that is also because of the, for the wellness of the members. So we do have um, debriefing sessions for those who do attend those um, traumatic situations. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. Um, Ms. Ingrid, did you ever feel at any time um, othered, uh, whether it be in um, a position where you were you know, deputy chief or maybe even gearing up to that uh, because of uh, just for what it was, the time of uh, just uh, kind of, uh, scarcity and representation did you feel that and and how did you um deal with that kind of sorry treatment? i i missed did i feel what was the term how did, you used yes uh being othered othered yes <laughs> okay you'd have to explain to me what that uh, means. <laughs> oh well um well we have uh, a room full of, of, of one community, and then, like you said, it was like yourself and another um, person of color. And then the othering is, uh, oh, um, well, you're not included in conversations, or the conversation shifts when you show up, uh, or, um, you know, you, you can tell that you're being othered. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. Um, I, I would have to say this. Um, I, I have felt that. I felt that um, specifically as you move up uh, the, the round or ladder, whatever you want to call it, um, I felt that at times when I spoke, maybe my thoughts or my, my, um, my discussion point weren't being uh, considered. So I have had, I have had that feeling. Uh, mm-hmm. I know that when I, when I entered into a room, um, especially, again, I'm a black female in a predominantly uh, white male environment. There may be a mm-hmm. couple of females there also. Mm-hmm. I, I always felt a little bit um, very conscious of that fact, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I felt that, but at the same time, I recognize that it's also important for me to show mm-hmm. or demonstrate what I'm capable of. Um, yes. I, I've had that, though, where I felt that my thoughts or my opinion was kind of discounted. I have felt mm-hmm. that. And it, it's, very, it's very hurtful. Mm-hmm. I, I'm also um, fairly vocal that yes. um, at times I don't mind saying, you know, um, can you guys stop and listen to what I have to say? Like, I'm that person, right? Or right. what happened to Opinion, especially if you said something and maybe someone else said the, says the same thing or suggestion or maybe in a little bit of a different way and suddenly theirs is kind what of... What a great crazy. idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and yours is discounted. So, no, I, 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 felt, I felt that. And, and, you know, I don't know. One thing I've, I've learned, um, I was very naive as a, um, when I started in policing. Right, I I came with this kind of, you know, wanting to um, change the world. Right, I was going to mm-hmm. help everyone. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and I, and I think I I I I say I say this to people as a child in Guyana. So I came to Canada at 14, but in the West Indies, 
if there was 26 kids in your class, you know, when it came to report cards, it would be like you'd be numbered from 1 to 26. I was always in the top three. So I always mm. knew I was bright. I was always encouraged by my mom, my, my siblings, and so I knew I was bright. So regardless of whether people try to make me feel less than I am, at times I think as a young officer I didn't realize some of the things because I just wanted to be the best officer I could be. Right. right. I wanted to learn. I wanted to do that job. Um, so I, I knew I was bright. So I've always kind of had that in the back of my mind. And I always say my foundation for me is what I got in Guyana because I came at 14. So I was pretty fairly solid. I was old enough to know, um, still young enough to maybe be influenced a bit, but old enough to know what's right, what's wrong, who I am as a black person and as a black mm-hmm. woman. I, yes, I was very conscious of the fact that I was a, I was black. I wasn't so much conscious of the fact I was female. I, I say mm-hmm. this to people on the job, but I was always conscious of the fact that I was black. Um, uh, what was I going with that? <laughs> but no, I no. hear you. So you know, I, I would go in the, I would have those discussions. I've had people who were really, really good to me, and they listened. They give mm-hmm. me opportunities, and I've had, had others who just. It was dismissive then. You, dismissive. you weren't considered for anything. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, I, I, tell my, I tell myself, and I'm not sure if this is right or wrong, that had I been, um, like I said, I was naive, but had I been maybe more aware about certain things that I'd encountered at my earlier days, I probably would have been a much more, um, what do they say in the islands, you may say masha person, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I was so mm-hmm. strong that I always overcame. You talked, you, you spoke about obstacles, and, you know, when I speak and I do presentations, I always say there's always those obstacles. Some present larger than others, but mm-hmm. you have to find a way to overcome it, yeah. right? And, and yeah. I feel that I've always done that. And, you know, I've always just stood my ground and be who I am. I'm, I'm pretty Absolutely. authentic, anyone will tell you. I'm an, I'm mm-hmm. an authentic person. Um, mm-hmm. And so I've always stood my ground and held firm. Absolutely. And, and would you agree, too, that you have to pick your battles? Because some are, are just the ones that just want to provoke and maybe pull out essences of you that you don't really want to go there. So you just have to walk away. And right, and you know what, uh, Nikki, that is really, really the key part of this because you know you can still win, whether it may mm. not be the war, it's war, the battle, but it's for yourself, you know, yes. even maybe for your community, you can still win because there are those that you can challenge, you can, you know, fight against, but then there's others you realize you've got to walk away because mm-hmm. it's you fighting against, you know what I mean, that uphill. So you do. I do. And, and, I, and I say this, and I'd say, you know, the people in Peel, there's, uh, Peel Police, there's been some really good people, like some really good people, right? You know, and, and I think you, you have to recognize that Peel has over 3,000 employees, right, even when I yeah. left. So you'll never have, you know, that uh, harmonious everyone is kind of the close together or whatever. You always have those outliers and and it happens it happens in policing it happens in peel there's Mm -hmm. people that um you can speak to anyone in peel and they will say ingrid always acknowledge it doesn't matter to me if a person is the um is in our clean cleaner or the maintenance department or is Mm -hmm. the chief if i see them it's hi how are you of course i I don't lose anything with doing that right and i move on i move on there's others that's would see you and wouldn't even acknowledge you. So, mm. it's important to acknowledge everyone at it every is. stage. Absolutely, every absolutely. Stage. Yep. Respect goes Everybody's a long way. World. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I always say that. You know, I, I try to teach that to um, the youth uh, when I interact with them. That you know, your attitude is your latitude, and and there, there's you don't lose anything by saying please, thank you, and just acknowledging people, saying good afternoon, saying good morning, um, being, being well-mannered. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> you know? So I think it's uh, really important. Uh, and I think some of them have lost it 
or uh, something yeah. as you know uh, and and I really want to go back to the old school of of teaching uh the very basics uh you know manners one o one to use right and and right. seeing how it really is uh, a, a, an incredible tool to have when you're engaging with people on a day to day basis it is so, so important it's so important yeah. you know it, sometimes Absolutely. it's just that simple acknowledgement that helps make a person's day or you know what i mean mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What's wrong with that but i like Absolutely. i like attitude use attitude is your latitude i like that i just wrote it down <laughs> Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, sharing, sharing is caring. <laughs> That's right. That's another one. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, I'm, I'm so uh, thrilled that we had this opportunity to learn so much uh, about, you know, your journey, and it's it's really fascinating. But uh, I would be remiss if I didn't ask the question: How did you balance? Um, family with uh, such a high stress job as yours. I mean, I know that you you are uh, you know incredible at, at maneuvering uh, maneuvering and and managing uh, you know the, the different auspices of uh, what the work uh, you know presented. But how did you handle the stress and uh, function as a mother and wife? Right. You know, it, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. I, I started with my, uh, with my son at three, and um, it was challenging because that was the time when, of course, you're in your learning stages, right? So it's even mm-hmm. more pressure. Um, a lot of late nights, and or I shouldn't even say late nights, could be late days because you worked your um, night shift, you went home. It's very difficult to sleep when a three-year-old wants to interact with their, with their mom. But um, my, so my, my son is with, um, with my ex-husband, um, mm-hmm. but I, I was fortunate. Like I said, I'm, I'm from a family of um, 11, so nine was alive at the time. I had a lot of support from my family. Not and, good. Um, so that really did make a huge difference, especially my mom. Um, she, was kind of, she was always there for me on the way. Um, mm-hmm. where, and then I had my daughter when I was, uh, I was in the job for maybe three years. I was on the job for three years because, sorry, mm-hmm. 86, 96 years. I was on the job for six mm-hmm. years when my daughter was born. And that was a little more challenging because back then it was only four months that you had for, um, to maternity leave. So mm-hmm. it was... It was a struggle. My mom would come up, uh, because we live in Cambridge, my mom would come up and spend a couple of days with my my current husband, who was also a police officer. So there was some understanding on his part because he was in the same field. And I remember there were days where my husband would have to drive my daughter down to, um, and my son, but my son was older, so it was a little bit different. But my daughter was a baby as an infant, to um, my work, and then we would exchange her in the parking lot, right? <laughs> so that just to make it so that we didn't have to leave her with someone or, may, you know, have my mom mm-hmm. come up to Cambridge mm-hmm. for a day or two. Mm-hmm. But those mm-hmm. were some of the struggles. Um, I've never been a great cook, but I've always <laughs> done my best to try and prepare the meals. But, you know, you try to do as much as you can on your days off. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that you have some, so that the, the kids at, at least, or the children at least, would have something to eat while you're um, while you're at work or you're not there. But it's right. thanks to family, especially my mm-hmm. mom. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks thanks a lot to her. Awesome, awesome. Yep. So um, I I really appreciate uh, again. I have to say uh, everything that you've shared. I'm I'm so much more of a fan now, uh, having heard. Um, all the the many experiences that you had uh, leading up to um, you know thirty four years of uh, a wonderful career as a police officer and and community ally uh, but i 'd like to ask you as um, a last question, uh, what would you offer as a message of hope to the listeners who are going right now through a, a, a plethora of emotions um, because of these very unusual times? What would you say? as as some kind of advice or or word of inspiration? You know, I want to say this, and um, I can get very emotional. I want to say this, um, you know, the the old, uh, I see this slave song says, we shall overcome, we Mm -hmm. will overcome this. Um, My aunt, I I lost my aunt to COVID. She lives in uh, New York. 
And oh, I'm so she, sorry. We just had her memorial service on Sunday, and of course, it's about doing it through the um, internet. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And and I want to say that um, from that, I had an opportunity to connect with family members who I haven't yes. connected with in over 20 years. You know, they're mm-hmm. in New York or they're in England, and you know, we were all online and and we we're talking and we we're kind of realizing, you know, now we're planning the family reunion, right? From this, so. I, I just want to offer this, this hope and say we know we're kind of we're going through self-isolation, social distancing, but mm-hmm. it's important that we reach out to, it's not just family, but people in the community, reach out and maintain and try and est- whether it's maintain or establish those relationships. For me, this was really telling because, mm-hmm. you know, seeing them all there and thinking, oh, my gosh, all this time I've been work, 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 right? And I haven't taken that opportunity to connect with these, you know, family members that I know know from um, uh, since I was a child, infant, right? So mm-hmm. it's, just, um, it's just use this opportunity to connect with, um, you know, family, friends, and just kind of have, have hope, have faith. We have to have faith and um, know we will we will overcome this we will absolutely absolutely thank you so much um ingrid berkeley brown for your uh, pearl of wisdom really appreciate it and uh, i hope uh and i i believe that people have been you know touched by your story thank you so much for being candid uh with your experience so i would like to uh, wish you all the best, and I hope that uh, when we are on the other side, we can meet again face to face and chat some more. <laughs> uh, definitely, um, uh, you know, we'll we'll invite you to our our, our studio, and we can have um, a video of of our conversation. So we'll plan that when uh, we get the green light. Uh, but uh, as for now, I, I just wish you again uh, uh, the very best. Stay safe, stay strong, stay positive. And, um, yeah, we'll connect and, very and I, soon. And I say the same for you, Nikki, and it's been my pleasure. Um, this has been a great conversation, a great discussion. And now I'm going to be um, a Nikki, <laughs> Nikki Clark fan. I'm going to join Aww. you. <laughs> I, I, I'm inspired. I, I actually took the opportunity to listen to a few, you know, sessions I, from three, four years ago. I, I have to spread the word. <laughs> Because I have a lot of family, certainly in uh, Peel region and outside, and yeah, have them to listen in to the Nikki Clark show. So I appreciate that, and I want you also, you and your family, to stay strong and stay safe. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. You've been listening to the Nikki Clark show with a very special guest, former Deputy Chief of Police for Peel Regional Police, Ingrid Berkeley Brown. Thank you again, Ingrid. Bye for now. No problem. Bye, Nikki.